Our God is a jealous God. I remember when I was younger, listening through that idea, it always kind of bothered me. I was trying to figure out what does it mean our God is a jealous God? And then as I got older, I started to realize that there are a lot of things that I tend to chase that I, that you probably in your life have chased that we run after. And, and I think God knows that the things that we run after, the things that we consume will never bring us the life or the satisfaction that he can bring. And so he says, you shouldn't have any other gods before me, not because he has some type of ego, but because he knows that there's something empty in the things that we chase. And, and, and because of his love for us, he is jealous for our affection because it is in him that we can find greatest joy. We're going through a series called Consumed. In the beginning of consumed, it begins with this, these three letters where it says con, and really that is what consumerism can be sometimes. The things that we chase, the, the way we use our finances, the way we, we, we dedicate our lives to different things, it is very easy to be consumed, to be conned by the consumer culture. And what God really wants for you and for me is for us to be consumed by him. Because it's in the, only in those moments when we recognize that it's, it's, it's him that can bring us the greatest joy, the greatest comfort, the greatest satisfaction in life. And, and to be consumed by him and not conned by the things that we chase in this world. Our memory verse comes from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, and it says this. It says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. There is a God who is jealous for you. And if you're like me in your life, there's been many different things that you run after and many things that you chase. And, and ultimately what we learn is the, the best place we can be is be standing in his presence and be consumed by who he is, by his love, by his grace, by his acceptance of us in our lives. In Matthew chapter 26, uh, there's a story of a woman who's consumed. A guy named, uh, a guy named Simon is throwing a house party and I imagine that he knows that Jesus is going to be, be coming there. And there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of buzz around Jesus at this moment. So I can picture this man being very excited. And I picture him telling his friends, like, like Jesus is coming. And, and probably some of the religious leaders are there. And, and he's probably got his friends, his inner circle. And, and so I imagine that moment as Jesus shows up and the party has begun and the meal has been like carefully prepared. Like everything is working just perfectly. And then all of a sudden, what Matthew will tell us is this woman will come into the scene kind of like a party crasher and not caring about what anybody else in the room is doing. She'll start pouring oil on Jesus's head. You ever have that moment where the room just falls silent and things get awkward? That moment when no one knows exactly what to do as they're watching this. And so we pick up in Matthew chapter 26 and we start to see what being consumed looks like as we, as we look at this lady who comes to anoint Jesus. This is what it says in Matthew 26, 6 through 16. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. Now, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked. This perfume, it could have been sold at a high price. We could have got money and given it to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. You see, when she poured this, this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted for him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. When we talk about being consumed and making Jesus the center of our lives rather than being consumed by the consumers around him, what, as I watch this lady, the first thing I start to realize is that we are called to be shamelessly, to, to, to give ourselves shamelessly before Jesus, to give shamelessly, uh, come before him, not worrying about what everybody else around us might be thinking. I think about the risk. I think about the awkwardness that she was willing to endure. 
I think about the wealth that she's carrying in front of him. And I think about all the eyes that were upon her. And, and those moments when we, we were just, I don't know if you ever have those moments where you're, you're fearful about what everybody else is thinking. And what I love about this story and what I love about her testimony as I like stare at her story is that she in her life is willing to give to Jesus shamelessly. It says that there, the disciples were there in the room. And sometimes I think they feel like they have to be like the PR people for Jesus. They're always trying to bring uh, some type of correction to the crowds. Earlier on, a group of kids have run up to Jesus to, to, to just climb up onto his lap. And, and the disciples are like, it says they're indignant and they rebuke the kids, like tell the parents, get the kids away. And Jesus is like, what are you doing? They're drawn near to worship. And here in this moment, here comes this lady and it's such a beautiful scene. It's such an incredible scene to watch, watch a person not care uh, about all the, the critique around her, but she simply brings her wealth and she pours it at the head of Jesus. And I thought of the awkwardness. I thought about oil pour, pouring over his head. I thought about the mess that it might've caused and, and, and the commotion and, 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 and the disciples, they, they read this and it says they became indignant and they're like, why this waste? And those words hit me because there's two different stories happening here. On one side, there is this woman who wants to be in the presence of her Lord and she loves him. And so she wants to give everything to her, him and, and, and she's coming like shamelessly before him. On the other side, it's the disciples. You know, earlier, earlier in my life, I always thought it was maybe the religious leaders, those who were against Jesus who were saying this, you know, why this waste? Why are we wasting all of this? But I realize it's his disciples as well. You know, sometimes, sometimes we can be the critic. As I was thinking about this story, I, I realized that there's probably two sides to it. Sometimes I might stop from giving shamelessly because I'm concerned about what all the critics might be saying. And I think about your life and my life as you go to work and we're called to give to Jesus Christ shamelessly. And sometimes we worry about the crowds, what, what they might be saying about, about how we might be spending our, our finances or what we might be giving to or how we might be laying down our lives. I think about when you go to school and your, your classmates and your friends, they, they see that you're different and they see that there's something that you are, you are giving up shamelessly for Jesus and you're like worried about what the critics might say. And then I realize that there's, on the other side, we might be the critics. That there might we might sometimes observe people giving everything that they are for the glory of God. And we might say, why this waste? And so I started thinking about the, the, like what's going on in the heart of a critic. And, and, and sometimes I think what a critic, what critics sometimes do is they can mistake. They can mistake worship for waste. She's bringing a lot of wealth. There's other accounts of this story and, and, and perhaps if, if they, they fall in line as the same story, what it says is that the jar that she is carrying is a year's worth of wages. And what can happen is we, and she's coming with everything that she has to bring it and worship to God. And they're like, that's a, that's a large amount. Why, why would you do this waste? And they miss that what she is doing is, is worshiping. What a critics can sometimes do, they get more focused on being bothered than seeing the blessing. They can get, get more caught up in like being bothered by something rather than seeing the blessing. What Jesus will say, he'll say something intriguing. He'll say, uh, he says, do not bother her. Why are you bothering her? Because she is preparing my body for its burial, which I think is intriguing because I wondered if she even knew that. And it made me think about when you and I give, when we give of our finances, when we give of our time, when we, when we choose to be generous, when we choose to worship God, that there are sometimes when we, when we give that we may not have a full picture of what God is doing with it. I'm not sure if she totally understood that Jesus was going to the cross. I'm not sure if she fully understood that she was, what she was doing and pouring this very expensive oil over his, his, his head was, was what he understood as getting ready for his death. But I am convinced that God 
can take what we give and use it for his glory. But a critic tends to see bother over, over blessing. The other thing that I think a critic can often do is we, they can tend to focus on, on, on money rather than the moment. Jesus is saying this moment is pivotal. And she stepped in and she's giving shamelessly and she's offering herself. And, and what can happen is we can see money and we, we miss that, that a mission is being accomplished in the midst of it. And so she gives. And she gives shamelessly. And I really think in our lives that God is calling us to step into that type of faith that says, I'm going to give and I'm not going to care what anybody else thinks. I'm going to give and I'm, I'm going to offer everything to God. And I don't care what the crowds, I don't care what they say. I don't care what they think of me. My greatest focus is to be upon my worship and glory of my King. May we be a people who choose in our lives to give shamelessly. Because on one side is the critic, on the other side is the champion. And so I start to see these features of, of what a champion looks like in giving shamelessly to him. Is he, here's what a champion is. A champion is first and foremost focused. They understand who God is and what he is, is doing in this world. And, and they don't allow the distractions of people's opinions or, or all of the other stuff to cloud. She says, I need to get to Jesus. And I want to offer to him the very best that I have. If only I in my life could move with such focus. Not too concerned about the people around us. It, champions also, they don't only have focus, but they're humble. Because in, in all reality, I don't think she was thinking about herself at all. So much of our financial decisions, so much of our generosity revolves around uh, kind of our own pride, right? A building of our own kingdoms and, and what's, what, what, if, if I give here, what's it going to cost there? And, and, and we, we always like are trying to figure out the ledger and stuff. She is humble in the sense of this is all about Jesus. This is not about me. Because ultimately you, you also see that the champions are generous. I'm not sure if this was even a money thing for her. I think what she saw is that her savior has come to town. And when your savior, com savior comes to town, she wants to give him the very best. It's an intriguing contrast. Disciples are like, well, we could have done this to give to the poor. You know what? I, everyone will always have something else to do with your money. Have you ever realized that? There were, everybody will always have something else to do with your money. And the disciples, we could have given this to the poor. I'm not sure if that was actually their major concern. And the other contrast to this is, 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 is Judas then leaves and he says, I'm now going to sell out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And it's, like, it's just such a weird contrast happening there. And so she teaches me to give, to give shamelessly. The other thing that I think a part of being consumed by the glory of God is not only giving shamelessly, but it's, it's, it's choosing to live stubbornly. It's choosing to live stubborn. We got any stubborn people out there? Any of you stubborn, like you're nudging your husband or your wife or your kids? Like, like here is permission in your life to live stubborn. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus will, uh, there's this little phrase there that says, from this time on. And, and that phrase kind of like, marinated in my head for a little while from this time on because there's something very definitive about that phrase. You ever have that moment in your life that you said from this time on? That moment you said well, from this time forward, I think about it like in terms of weddings, you like you stand before your husband or your wife or what soon to be and you say from this day forward, this is the covenant, this is the commitment that I can make and, and we're to live stubbornly in that. I think of that time where we make New Year's resolutions around New Year's time. Like, like from this day on, I'm going to draw a line in the sand. I'm, I'm going to the gym or I'm not eating this and I'm not eating that. And, and we, we try to resolve ourselves. And, and I love candy. I often tell people sugar is my favorite vegetable. <laughs> and, and loving candy, I, I, unfortunately, I've kind of ingrained it on my kids. 
I've ingrained it on my kids to the point where there's this little store on the way to whenever we go back to our house in our town and, and there's an aisle there with a whole bunch of candy and I take my kids in, all, all, all seven of us and we'll each get a bag of candy and we'll go up to the cashier and I'll make the same joke every time. We've decided to eat healthy today. No one ever laughs at it except me and, and, and we'll, we'll cash out. And, and after several weeks of that, I realized that this might be a problem. And what has happened to my kids, I, so I hit this moment, I hit these grand moments in my life where line in the sand, we ain't going there anymore, or as, at least as much. And look, I'm gonna live stubbornly in this. I'm gonna be resolved in this. We're not gonna just be a candy family. But then we'll be driving home from school and the back seat will start chirping. Can we stop? Can we stop? Can we stop? And if I'm not careful, I break. My from this time on becomes, eh, maybe today. We, as a people of God, are called to live stubborn. You see, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has told his, he's asked his disciples a question. And his question is, it's, a, it's a neat question. He says, who do people say that I am? And they give him a bunch of answers. Uh, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, uh, some say a prophet. And Jesus stops, he says, okay, okay, you, who do you say that I am? And Peter, I mean, he's had a great, a lot of great moments in the story of Jesus. He's had a lot of low moments, a lot of high moments, walking on water, all of this stuff. Uh, but Peter, I think, might come to the, the peak of, of Peter's moment because he says this, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And at that moment, generations upon generations has come together of, of promises and hopes and dreams. Grandfathers had told their grandkids about the hero of ages who would arrive in, in Israel's history. And, and he would come as like a mighty superhero as what we would call today. And so, so, so they waited, generations waiting for the Messiah, for the hero to, to, to arrive on the scene. And what Peter is saying at this moment, what he's saying is, I know who you are. He says, you are the hero. You are the Christ. And then we come to Matthew 16, verse 24. No, Matthew uh, 16, 21. And it begins with this, from that time on. And watch what it says. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. That he must suffer many things. Many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life again. Peter piped up from the back seat and he said, he said, Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me because you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter says, you're the Messiah. And at this point in the scriptures, you'll, you'll find these phrases start to echo it over and over again. And Jesus set his face. And Jesus sought and lived stubbornly in accordance with God's will. Pulling back from Isaiah, it says this beautiful, beautiful phrase. It always stays in my mind. It says, he set his face like flint, like a rock, like this is what God has called me to do. And from this day forward, not everybody's gonna understand it. It's not gonna, it's gonna look, he, he flips the script. He's like, instead of, instead of going to, a, getting a crown, I'm gonna get a cross. Instead of, instead of a throne, it's gonna be a tomb. And no one understands it. And there's this temptation when no one understands it for us to start to bend. And see these moments that we're called to, called to live, stubborn. You see, I know that there's decisions that we make in our lives sometimes, sometimes in moments of, uh, of passion, sometimes in moments of inspiration of God's spirit working inside you and me. And we come to moments and we say, from this day forward, I am going to give my wealth to my king. From this day forward, I'm going to give my life to my king. From this day forward, he, I, my life is his living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. Every part of me, every ounce of me, take it all, Lord. Let me live for your glory. But then the kids start talking from the back seat. 
Or that friend speaks up and like, oh, what, are you, what are you doing? Why don't, we, why don't we go do this or that? Peter says, you don't have to do this. And Jesus, in a moment of beautiful stubbornness, says, get behind me. You see, I think we come to moments in our lives when we have to choose to live stubborn. That the conviction, the calling that that Jesus has put on your life and and what you have said with your mouth that we now work out in our actions and we start to, to give and to live, to give shamelessly and to live stubbornly in the direction that he has set us. And so maybe in your life, your face is less than flint. And God is saying, no, I want you to draw a line in the sand from this day forward. This is what it looks like. I'm going to, I'm going to give for God's glory. And to not back down from that and to, to not let people tempt you to do otherwise because that's what tends to happen. It's an opportunity to get to live positively stubborn. Where in your life is God calling you to live positively stubborn? And that means stubborn in the best way possible. You see, what does a positively stubborn person look like? A positively stubborn person looks like Jesus and they understand the urgency. You see, I think what Jesus is saying is, Peter, you are a temptation to me. Kind of like when he was going through the wilderness and, and he's called out of the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and, and Satan comes along and he says, you could have all this. All of this could be yours. Just do something different. Just, just chase after it. And yet Jesus says, no, I am going to seek to do God's will, not my will, not your will. Look how many times it says, I must. God, give us these moments in our lives where we say we must even when we're motivated otherwise. So to be positively stubborn is to understand urgency. God is doing something in our world and he wants to use every part of us, every piece of us, every one of us to advance his mission together. And so we understand the urgencies because we want the most people in the kingdom in the shortest time. And so that's the urgency. God, how can you use me today? God, God how can I give to, to bring to your glory today? Lord, Lord what, what alabaster jar of oil can I put at your feet so that you can use for your purpose that I might not even completely see? We understand the, the urgency when we become positively stubborn. We also start to understand not only the urgency of things, but we embrace our purpose that God has given you and me a set amount of time on earth and he has resourced us with everything we need for a life of godliness. And that that we are to not be overly focused on our purposes or upon our kingdom building, but upon his kingdom building. So Lord, Lord, use us for your purpose. God has surrounded us with people. As a church, we say, Lord, give me every day someone to share your love with. There's an urgency to that. There is a purpose to that and we embrace that purpose together as God's church because it's bigger than any one of us. Not only embraces purpose, but it also endures rejection because there is rejection along the way, particularly when we're talking about finances because it means choosing to say no to things. It it means rejecting, you know, the things in our back seat that are saying, hey, you should get this or you should get that. Like like it, it endures what the world might say. What a waste. Why would you do that? Why would you give up your time? Why would you give up your treasures? Why would you give up your talents to, to all of these endeavors? And so we learn to endure rejection and we live stubborn. May our faces be like flint as we follow Jesus into his mission. And then lastly, it shuns distraction because there are a lot of shiny things out there. A lot of shiny things that get our time, a lot of shiny things that get our attention. We're called to live shamelessly, to give shamelessly. We're called to live stubbornly. Finally, we're called to die strategically called to die strategically. You know, I was thinking the other day, there is nothing strategic about the death of a squirrel. You know what I'm talking about? You're driving down the road, 
Your car is coming, barreling down on a squirrel, and the squirrel is like, oh, what in the world is going on? And so it starts running back and forth. It freezes for a second. It, it stares at you for a second. It starts to go one way. It turns from going that way to going another way. It does a little dance in the middle, and, and then it goes under the tire of your car. There is nothing strategic about the death of a squirrel. And yet sometimes I think that's how we live our lives. We chase this, we chase that, we're consumed by this, we're consumed by that, we're, we're running every which way and there is no strategy. And yet Jesus will give this invitation. He says, come follow me and I will show you how to die. And you don't have to wait for the great by and by to start investing your life. We're all gonna die. But Jesus will say, today choose to follow me and die strategically. And I really do think that's the power of giving. That is the power of understanding the life that Jesus called us to is that he's got a purpose in this world that, that the king of the universe is doing something and he's inviting you and me into it. And I can run around like a squirrel, you know, like, like, like making all of these different decisions or I can say, no, no, my life is God's. God, how do you want to use my life to bring forth your kingdom? Lord, where are you in my life calling me to deny myself? This is what Jesus goes on to say. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Go back and follow the musts of these passages. If anyone wants to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, to follow means that you're going to die to yourself. They must deny themselves, they must take up their cross and they must follow me for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be if someone gains the whole world yet forfeits their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with his angels and, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. I love the beginning of that section because it begins with the grand whoever. You see, that's the inv invitation of Jesus. It is whoever, whoever wants to follow me. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, there's an invitation to die strategically today, this very moment for your king and say, from this day forward, I will live stubbornly for him. I will give shamelessly for him and I will die strategically for him because I am invited in, into his mission, into his purposes. Whoever wants to follow me, there's an invitation to follow him. And this is they must. There's no options. He says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And a lot of us have gone down that road of trying to build our own lives and saving our own lives. And Jesus says, that's just worshiping other gods and being consumed by other things. But if you want to really find what life is, die strategically. For anyone who gives his life for me will find it. What can a man give? What can a man get? What can a man chase that will fulfill the satisfy, that will satisfy the deepest longing of the soul? There's nothing. And so what does it look like to lay down my life? It means laying down my wants comes a point where he says, you don't have in mind the will of God. You have in mind the will of man. And when we talk about finances, when we talk about giving, when we talk about stewardship, not only of our wealth, but of our lives, often this is one of the obstacles. It's learning to lay down my wants. Kind of along with that, it's learning to lay down my works. It's no longer some type of achievement faith. In fact, Paul will say everything that I had, all, all the applause that I had gotten, all the, all the trophies of, of all my boxes that checked off. He says, I will, I will throw them all away. I consider them rubbish simply to be able to come into the presence of Jesus, pour my wealth of my oil upon him so that he might get the glory. I'll lay down my wants. I'll lay down my, I'll lay down my works. It means laying down my, my world the building of my kingdom, the building of my house, the building of my finances, the building of all, all my stuff. Lord, I give you my world. It's not just laying down my, my, my wants, my works, my world. It's also laying down my wealth. God, here's the jar. You know, I was thinking about this story, the story of the woman back in Matthew 26, the woman who brought the 
her jar and unashamedly gave everything she had to Jesus and all the ridicule and all the stuff. And I've, whenever I've read this story, I'm like, ah, oh, man, I just want to celebrate her. What a, what a great moment. Like, what a great offering. Like, like I'm a shy kid. Like to be able to, to, to not care about the jeers and not care about what anybody thinks. Oh, what, what a great moment to celebrate her. And, and then I realized I'm not just called to celebrate her. I'm called to be her. You and I, we're called to be her. Not caring what anybody else thinks, not caring what anybody else says, but here is our king. And I will give shamelessly to him. I will live stubbornly for him and I will die strategically with him. It says in verse 13 about this woman, truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout this world, it's not lost in me that in this very moment, She's honored. Jesus' words are coming true. Because he says, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And here's what I would say is there is a legacy here. And I would give an invitation to you that it's not just hers. That we as God's people can choose today to give of our wealth to set aside all the stuff that doesn't belong in our following of Jesus Christ and say, God, I will give you everything. Honor God with our wealth. Honor God with our lives. So maybe this is a moment where you gotta ask yourself what shameless giving looks like. Maybe this is a moment where you have to say from this day forward, Despite the kids in the back seat, I'm going to keep moving in the direction of God's will and I will choose to give and I'll stand beside it because I've made a choice here in this moment to die strategically so that I can partner with Jesus in what he's doing. Will you all pray with me? Father God, we thank you that in you is life and in the midst of all the things that we can consume, Help us to see them for the con that they are and instead become consumed by you. Father, show us how to give and to live and to die strategically. And Father, then help us to do it. In your name we pray, amen.